Um, the first question that I really wanted to kind of invite uh, those of you who would like to, to jump in and uh, share your thoughts on um, is to go back to basics and think about what in your context in each of your companies is really um, non-personal data because we know there are two things. There's this anonymized data sets and then there are data sets that never had to do with uh, personal information in the first place. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'm happy for anyone to jump in or I'm happy to call on one of you, but uh, the first kind of question for discussion I wanted to ask is kind of what proportion of your data sets do you think fit this description? And what is the kinds of data you're thinking of as non-personal data? So uh, happy for you to jump in, otherwise I invite any of you to come in. I Kyla, can jump in, I guess. Yeah. Uh, our case is very peculiar. Can I please uh, just quickly uh, ask you all to introduce yourself as, as you speak, because I we wanted to save time and not do that up front. Yeah, sure, sure. Kyla, share. I head technology at Zerola. We are a stockbroker. We are a stockbroking firm. So I was saying that our case is quite peculiar because we are uh, heavily regulated. And by heavily, I mean individually and separately regulated by multiple entities. And NPD is, uh, at least in our industry, a bit vague because all data is sensitive financial data tied to people and identities. All the data that we collect, every single transaction that we generate, it's all personal and connected to people. So. Apart from that, there could be certain inferred data that could be generated from this transactional data. Uh, could be uh, investment patterns or financial habits, etc., which we don't do right now. So in our case specifically, we don't really have any NPD. Every bit of data that we have is highly sensitive and personal. Yeah. Chaitanya, I don't know if you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I can jump in now. Uh, so, hi guys, I'm uh, Chaitanya. I am the uh, Chief Innovation Officer for Ozontel Systems. Uh, we are a cloud telephony company. So, I think we are in the same boat like Kailash, uh, being in uh, uh, the telephony space. We are also very heavily regulated. We have Tri, DOT, blah, blah, every guy, <laughs> everybody wants uh, uh, to control call data. And I think there are enough rules out there already uh, protecting call data and uh, call detail records, for example. And for example, if you want to find out some information about a particular call, uh, you'll have to go and get a warrant. And uh, then uh, we'll have to uh, give out that data. And we also have rules saying that we have to store the data uh, for almost like a an year. And, uh, and again, depending on different verticals, like if it's healthcare call centers, they have certain other requirements. If it's financial call centers, they have other requirements. Um, so that way, uh, we are in a similar boat, like Kailash, in the sense that everything is, every call is personal and every call data that we store is personal. Uh, but obviously we do have, if you want to uh, look at the non-personal data, uh, the kind of data that we can provide is uh, call volumes, peak hour calls, call drops that happen, what kind of call drops happen. So there are multiple things which can be done. Uh, we have started doing some of that. Uh, for our own internal purposes. Uh, so to track, for example, uh, at six o'clock, uh, Airtel to Reliance calls drop in Bangalore it is one example, let's say. Uh, if you guys have been trying to reach a Vodafone to Airtel, you get a call drop. And uh, we sort of can predict to certain level uh, based on previous history, what kind of drops can happen. So that is, I would say, come under non-personal data. Uh, but most of our data we store it comes under personal. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to quickly ask uh, whether Kranti, Tanmay, and Shrujana want to jump in. And we were just on our first point of trying to identify actually what falls under this regulation, practically speaking. Um, seems more appropriate for certain companies than others. But yeah, uh, Shrujana, Tanmay, or Kranti, when if you wanted to uh, weigh in. Hey, folks, this is Tanmay. Um... I'm, I'm, I'm the founder CEO at Hasra. Um, Hasra is a cloud infrastructure company. So that means that we um, we're kind of similar to maybe the way you think about AWS or Akamai, uh, similar to that. And we're, we're, we're based in the, in the US, we operate in India though, we have several customers in India. Um, so uh, this regulation is kind of, uh, or, or this, uh, 
intended regulation is interesting to us. Um, I think mm, I think it's very confusing for us because we're uh, we we do of course have a certain amount of data that we have, but then there's a there's a lot of data that we have that it actually belongs to our customers. Um, and if it comes to kind of cloud infrastructure, it's really hard to understand what PII data or non-PII data is, right? Like for example, the configuration of your infrastructure. Um, is that is that NPD? Is that is that personal data, right? It's very, very confusing. Um, I mean, it's technically anonymized because it's somebody's configuration, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like, imagine if you were GitHub, right? And we have somebody's source code now. So all of the data that you have is all of people's source code. Now, you know, what, what is that kind of, what is that data, right? So, so in that sense, it's a little bit, uh, I say a little bit mildly, but it's a little bit confusing. So yeah, that's, that's me. Hi, this is Kranti. Um, I'm uh, AVP Data Science at uh, Swiggy. Um, firstly, uh, we collect a lot of data from transaction to location and try to make insights out of it or make customer experience better. Um, if even a single identifier exists, even if it is anonymized, I am not sure how it can be non-personal. Um, I, I just am not able to fathom that. It's very easy to reconstruct. So like even forget even um, identifier, even if location data exists, I think it's um, easily reconstructable. So I'm at a loss, except for very high level aggregate data, it makes sense, right? Uh, but then uh, it begs the question, let's say I'm actually sharing the data on where do people like to eat or where do people like to order from isn't that violating the privacy of the restaurant entity who is a different party altogether and how do you uh, like this doesn't even cover uh, three-party platforms right it only talks about customer and customer privacy but then there is enterprise privacy and we don't essentially we are answerable to them too so i don't know how that comes into play um, and to top all of that, um, it's a competitive world out there. And let's say we decide to make even as simple as things like volumes uh, public um, and you're not a traded company yet, the implications can be pretty drastic um, on investment or any other thing. So yeah, I, I, I don't understand um, how this is going to go forward, frankly. Thanks, Kranti. And I'm going to quickly ask uh, Srijana to jump in um, as well, if you're back, Srijana. Uh, and given your vantage point, ported Google and uh, with Vadwani, if you had anything to share. I think Srijana may have some audio trouble. We're trying to sort it out our end. Um, maybe we can carry on and then uh, come back to Srijana when she's uh, back on. Sure, sure not. we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I guess as the moderator of the debate was a non-techie, this is a great kind of confirmation for someone who's been reading the report. I think when it came out, the big question was really what's left? Like, what does this actually cover? <laughs> the good thing is that the report is fairly clear at, uh, when it talks about mixed data sets, right? Because it says that where uh, PII and non-personally identifiable information are intricately connected, it falls under the personal data protection bill, which makes sense. Um, I think the tricky, and, and then the question is really, you know, to the point of inferred data that Kailash was talking about, we know that inferred, inferred data also is clearly personally identifiable information. So that's covered off. And so it really leaves, what it, it does leave is some kind of, the kind of volume data that we were talking about, um, you know, that ozone tail might be producing or those kinds of basically business intelligence. Um, and again, there the report uh, at the risk of educating the audience, talks about intellectual property and now business intelligence is intellectual property. So again, we have that kind of figured regulatory wise. And, you know, so really the question is if IP deals with it, personal data deals with it, and then you have some competition regulations to deal with people not abusing and like hoarding data, um, what is really the objective here? Uh, be that as it may, and I think so, I, I think that is, I, I can't ask the question. See, I've spoken to some committee members. We'll <laughs> wait to see. That's why they have the second version of the report. Um, be there is a may, even if it comes in and we are unclear of what it is, I think the second 
the thing that it opens up is even if the majority of data is PII, it seems like where when that data becomes anonymized, you become subject to this regulation because the whole point of personal data laws is that you anonymize the data, you improve customer privacy, and then you can kind of use that data for innovation. Uh, and this is where I kind of wanted to ask all of you um, on the question of anonymization, because clearly when you're holding this kind of personal data, um, there is particular types of anonymization you're implementing. If it's not too difficult to talk about specifically, is it database level anonymization or are you guys doing some kind of credential management? Uh, maybe first we can just talk about technically how do you handle anonymization and then come back to how would, you know, depending on the kind of anonymization, how does this framework work? Hit, hit you. Uh, again, I'm opening it up for discussion, but happy to kind of call on anyone in case we have coordination problems. Yeah, I can go first for this. Uh, uh, so the type of anonymization, uh, we generally don't anonymize by default. Uh, because again, the what we do is uh, we take the telephone lines from the telecom operators, and we provide the software uh, to the customers so the customers own the data we don't even uh, we pro that is protected at the database level itself so we can't access the customer's data but some of the customers ask us uh, to anonymize uh, on their behalf while storing it in the database itself they don't want uh, let us say for example some of the numbers that we call so that we handle by using ma masking so we just mask the numbers and some other examples are, for example, credit card numbers have to be masked uh, as per PCIDSS and uh, certain rules that are again uh, taking care of a lot of these issues. So that, those are the things that we manage. But our anonymization is mostly at a customer level. So if the customer asks us, we anonymize. Uh, and we generally do it with masking, uh, not a very high fi high techy kind of thing, but general masking procedures. Uh, well-known algorithms are there, we mask it and so that it can't be recovered kind of thing. Uh, the other thing that we do is uh, we anonymize through aggregation. Uh, so if it's an aggregate data, then again, uh, pinpointing uh, at an individual level is hard. Uh, so for example, if I get uh, a call drops, like 20% uh, uh, call drops happened. So that's an aggregate. So uh, we don't actually store the information that this person called, X person called, Y person, and that call dropped. That information is not stored. We sort of aggregate and store the aggregate information. So aggregation and masking are the two ways, and we generally do it at the customer level. Yeah, I can, I can, I can go next. I think from our point of view, again, as a cloud infrastructure vendor, we, we don't anonymize data. Um, there's, there's no use case for it. Uh, we do encrypt data, of course, uh, for uh, when it is stored, but but anonymizing or masking is not really uh, something that we that we need a use case that we run into. Um, when we use data, our uh, information from our customers that we need to use for our internal kind of analytics, uh, product design purposes, uh, infrastructure purposes, right? If you want to decide, for example, how to handle people's loads in a particular way and stuff like that, right? So that requires certain aggregate analysis uh, or even pointed analysis where we make the data available internally to the company in an anonymized way so that that data is not uh, from a customer protection point of view. So um, I would consider that IP. Um, I would, that is critical business intelligence. That is of course something that we can't share. So, um, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of our, that's kind of the place where anonymization happens. Uh, technically where it happens is it happens uh, in in some kind of an ETL process where data kind of goes from a source of truth to uh, another anonymized uh, sink of data and the anonymization process is done on route. So, so that's, I mean, technically that's how it happens. I, uh, I can go next. I think, I think uh, the, the question itself and the way anonymized data and anonymization within the context of companies is referenced throughout the paper is very ambiguous. It makes it sound like anonymizing data and processing it, mining it as a standard practice. Uh, I, I don't think so. So we don't anonymize any data because uh, it doesn't fit into the framework of our regulated existence. So we, let's say there's a database with sensitive data 
and the risk management team needs some aggregate statistics on which financial instruments seem slightly more risky or you know there's some sort of an anomalous activity it could just be a simple report which uh, which could be 10 numbers which is generated out of the out of a database with a billion rows there's no concept of anonymization you don't copy data into an anonymous data set and then run queries i think it is more relevant in the case cases of companies where data is mined and passed around to external parties you know external silos not really within companies or maybe there are companies that are so large that there are divisions that are siloed off from each other but for any reasonably medium sized to large company it's it's very ambiguous and it's not binary do you anonymize or not so uh, like i said we don't because the statistics that we need to derive can be derived in real time from the source database and nothing no data gets passed passed around outside uh, the silos that are regulated yeah also, also just to maybe add to that i think the main confusion here is that even if the whatever the use case whatever the technical implementation of anonymization is the data that is anonymized and used uh, that is definitely kind of that is that is business data which is ip right like that is not data that can be um, shared with other people because then what are you doing as a company right so that is i think that is the that that is an, a, another layer of confusion on top of this yeah and i guess just to kind of uh, tease that out a little bit right um, to make sense of how this report is dealing with it but very honestly even the personal data protection bill which in any case will apply to all of your companies and there we do talk about anonymized data as being the boundary for when you have certain obligations so i guess i have two questions and I'm happy to hear all of your thoughts whoever would like to jump in the first one really is is it primarily i mean is this a distinction between data that is in flow or data that is actually you know that you have downloaded onto your systems or which are sitting on your systems is that the distinction um in terms of when you say uh, you know i'm able to compile this information directly from you know whenever i need to um is that the, that's more of a yes or no just to clarify for the audience but i think the deeper question then becomes is it that um all of those processes are not hard you know kind of terrible word to use but hard coding and anonymization by default right now is that because there is no regulatory requirement currently in india because i know in other countries for instance if you touch any pii at all and if it gets downloaded through your data flows into your systems there is an automatic requirement for anonymization so that i think is that just a factor of regulation the first question sorry uh, that was about the technicality of anonymization wasn't it i was just saying is that because it's not it's kind of data in transit and that's why you don't oh, think oh sorry yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, not not necessarily it's not because uh, the certain things are certain way it's just because that is how it's evolved organically we've built our systems in such a way that no personal data has to be downloaded onto anyone's systems even within the company so all these risk aggregates etc reporting happens on a dashboard and nobody really gets access to the underlying sensitive data so that's how we were engineered it and i'm pretty sure that's how most companies do it you, you don't really have to download an excel sheet and you know do analysis yeah and, and the second uh, second bit again uh, it, it's connected to this we don't it's not because there there are there's a lack of regulations in fact for us there is actually a 54 point circular from our markets regulator which kind of indirectly touches upon these things so we are already compliant uh, but it's not because there's a lack of regulations it's just because it how it's just because how we've structured it there is no need to pass sensitive data out of the system via apis or via file, file download so it it yeah didn't have to build it and uh, yeah i'd also like to add on to that first point of as a as as a data infrastructure company this concept of data at rest and data in transit is something that is very interesting and the lines that are blurring right like when you say data in transit do you literally mean like bytes on the wire because data in transit is becoming a concept that's increasingly hard to define like data in a queue is maybe data in transit but it's also data at rest it's also data that can be queried while it's in the queue while it's in transit right so there's a the 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 notion of data in transit and data at rest is uh is not necessarily useful when when we think about uh when we think about anonymization because the lines are getting blurred 
um, that, that is one. The other thing I think is also is that the use cases for anonymization are, 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 are you know, just to, just to echo the previous point is that they, they're kind of, they're not very large, they're very few, right? There's not too many use cases for anonymizing data apart from perhaps like, you know, internally sharing and stuff like that. So, uh, and I think oftentimes uh, to a non-technical audience, perhaps, uh, and if, if you haven't thought about it, right, and, and uh, is this notion of anonymization and uh, data protection, is data protection and anonymization are slightly independent things, right? Data protection is when you want to protect that data, the way it's accessed, the way it's encrypted, uh, who gets access to it and stuff like that. And then uh, uh, anonymization is a very separate kind of thing that happens when you uh, make parts of that data available to other stakeholders, right? So um, so to, to basically frame it as broadly as saying anonymization will protect data, that's not a that's not a useful statement because nobody is actually anonymizing data, right? Like if, if you think about just the unit or particular business function and not no other functions outside outside that function, right? Or a small startup or a or a very kind of vertical function, then then there is no anonymization happening in the first place. But there's a lot of data protection that's happening. So anonymization for security, anonymization for uh, protecting customers or protecting their data or for adhering to regulations, uh, reg regulatory requirements is, uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a little bit of like, there's a, there's a little bit of conflation that could happen there. So I just, just wanted to, just want to point that out. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I'll just give Kranti or Chaitanya an opportunity to jump in, in case you wanted to, but I did I want to kind of take that point forward. Did you want to share anything? So, uh, the personal data, especially for the customers as well as the DEs and stuff, we do anonymize. And so think about it as any data which is accessible by a system or a person, um, which is not customer facing, right, is essentially anonymized on the key attributes which are traditionally thought as private which include name, phone number and stuff, right? So nobody can actually visually see that data. So that does exist. And I think that does bring in some degree of common, um, I would say basic privacy, which is required um, because yeah, these are powerful data elements and nobody should be purview to that. Um, so that is, uh, I think, yeah, those are at play already. But to answer the other question, um, is it at a database level or a record level? I believe it is at a database level. Um, but yeah, I, I, I haven't worked on them um, personally. Um, the other question you asked was, <laughs> I couldn't get the grasp of those things. So I'll refrain from that. I am also with Kailash here. Uh, most of the data we don't download. There's no need for us to download in Excel and uh, deal with that. It's just dashboards that we show up. But, uh, but there are, there's one small uh, difference, right? I mean, uh, some companies, uh, let's say like Swiggy, direct, uh, if I interact with Swiggy, uh, uh, I am, uh, that's a relationship between me and Swiggy. But for us, I, I am not a direct, uh, no customer directly deals with me. They deal with Swiggy. If Swiggy is my customer, then I deal only with Swiggy. So that's how it works. So there, it's a little bit different. Like that data, the calls that happen, that data belongs to Swiggy. And it's up to Swiggy to define their anonymization techniques. But for me, all I need to do is to make sure that if uh, Swiggy is my customer, Big Basket is my customer, XYZ is my customer, they, uh, that data, uh, my engineers wouldn't know which data belongs to whom. That's pretty much it. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's always interesting for me to have these conversations because basically it just shows the kind of disconnect in mental models, right? Um, and I think that's why it's important to have these conversations. Uh, but I do think what, I think the level of mistrust we're seeing currently is probably because of that disconnect. People don't know whether it's generally that's the way it is or they're just being told that's the way it is because it's convenient. Um, but to bring it back, I mean, to the two points that I wanted to kind of uh, respond and kind of take forward, one of which was just on this idea of obviously, you know, two of you are B2B businesses in some sense. So it's a very different 
kind of conception and under the personal data uh, bill, you would think of yourself as a data processor. You're not a data fiduciary. You're just doing it as third party on behalf of someone else. And obviously that means your liability and risk management measures change, right? And we, we all kind of know that. But I think, and, and nowhere, you know, are we conflating anonymization and data protection. Clearly there's a range of cryptographic techniques and anonymization is one within that arsenal. And then you have data security. Um, playing in. So we're not getting into the wider fray. I think the, the part where data protection and non-personal data intersect is this idea of anonymization and purely because the mental model there is, you know, when you capture information at that point of capturing it itself, you can do, you know, perform some techniques to anonymize it. You could pseudonymize it or masks it and, you know, things like that. So even if you're not, you know, the minute the data hits your system, uh, you know, the kind of really kind of cutting edge people pushing the privacy envelope as citizen advocates would be saying you know even at that level you, even at the level of credentials it's all anonymized and i guess you know potentially it's possible it's going to cost you a lot more money to do that uh, but we'll get to that later and i guess that just to take it forward from that point right like um even in these kinds of situations where you you might be and now the the danger is that even if you're dealing with data that is not at all anonymized uh it's just kind of personal data swishing around then very clearly you don't have to care about the npd framework and i think that's where this gets complicated because now you kind of have the option of going under one framework or the other and as a company you would take a call would i rather anonymize and have these costs or not anonymize so that's the next part of the discussion i want to nudge us to but before we get there um i think we might have srujana back again srujana i don't know if you can hear us at all but um yeah, thanks so yeah. much and yeah. apologies to everyone i i think i should have checked this didn't want to disrupt the flow um so, but you know really glad to be here and i just got in a few minutes back yeah. yeah, and I'd love to kind of hear your perspective, you know, because we uh, we did want to grill you both as Google and as Vadwani, uh, but we, we won't, we're, be, we're being very civil at this point of time. Uh, very quickly, kind of, you know, the two things we were talking about, and it's a great kind of time to have you in the conversation is, um, the first part of the conversation to summarize is primarily a lot of the information people are working with is PII or personally mm -hmm. identifiable information. So then really the question is what is left over for an NPD framework? And I think the two things that stood out for us are really kind of business intelligence, analytics type of data, aggregate intelligence, which people really didn't feel should felt like, you know, that's intellectual property. I don't know if you have a different view based on what you see. Do you see kinds of data that you think okay, this is not IP, this is not personal data, this is something else. All right, right. So definitely would like to chime in. Thanks so much, Malika, for, uh, you know, repeating this for me. So, you know, just by design, right, a lot of data of interest, like you called out, right, pertains to objects that are of relevant to society, right? And given that they are bound to some real humans who are connected to the data, and oh, what you could say the non-personal aspect, right, really depends on the specificity of those associations. Even though you mentioned that aggregates are non-personal, right? Like you can just take something like aggregate case counts. Right? They have been derived from uh, some real um, health conditions and real people and uh, narrow the scope goes, right? So the more identifying it becomes, right? And the externalities are like very localized. And, uh, you know, same thing with even something you know, that you would think very non-personal like the water table in an area. This might seem like a pure NPD but it's also associated with some real humans. And the smaller the area of focus, the uh, more would be. And even if at the point of capturing the data, if the data set was not connected to humans, there is in fact a real world link. And there are those, uh, uh, you know, those kind of impacts. Now, what I'm just trying to say here is that this whole notion of NPD, like you called out already, lies on this whole spectrum, right? And there's a specificity spectrum. There's, of course, some data pertaining to just like universal physical phenomena, like say astronomy, chemical reactions, and so on. But as uh, you know, the other part, uh, panelists would have pointed out, most of what we are dealing in businesses and the corporate world uh, pertains to you know, data that's actually closely tied to human activity. And uh, so even aggregates are dangerous in, fact, in the sense like dangerous meaning they do have impact. So we have to deal with them carefully. So given that I do feel that a separate, um, you know, uh, taking NPD apart is probably not the ideal thing to do. Yeah. 
and uh, that's on one of the aspects. I also wanted, I was just following the conversation you had with uh, Kranti and others on the anonymization bit. And even there, I feel like, you know, you know, and here when I'm thinking of anonymization, I'm just thinking, interpreting it as any kind of privacy safe uh, transformation. This could be aggregation, some kind of sub selection, perturbation of data. And again, you know, even though you said like about the organizations, I can't probably speak about the specifics of the organizations I work for, but uh, as others have called out, right, folks try to comply to the minimal exp extent that's required for, uh, you know, legal compliance and, um, you know, which is often just removal of the uh, PI fields, right? And some big MNCs do take it more seriously because of the repercussions to their own businesses. They don't want their users stealing these their data. So they are like a lot more careful about how they safeguard it. And again, here, I just wanted to point out that there are multiple ways to quantify this privacy, you know, these, these notions of K anonymity, L diversity, and like you called out, right, T closeness, all of these, right, do permit attacks. And even the more robust information theoretic approaches such as differential privacy, even those, uh, uh, you know, degrade in the presence of secondary data set. So if there's correlated data set outside, right? So that can impact your notion of privacy. So all I want to just call out is like, you know, on all of this anonymization, they have worked on a lot of these projects which involve linking records and uh, pretty much, right? If you get a data set, uh, if you actually have access to a data set, even without the uh, PI kind of fields, uh, there's a huge risk of uh, de-anonymization or re-identification. Right. And um, and the other thing I wanted to uh, call out is it's not just that we need to worry about that uh, extreme case where you identify a person and a specific uh, information pertaining to a person. There is a negative impact and cost associated even with just like narrowing that scope. Like say if someone were to know that like, you know, women uh, in a particular age group in a particular colony have like say 80% cancer prevalence, right? that itself can cause, I mean, no one's being personally identified here, but there is a risk associated with it. So this is something I think, I mean, I don't want to go on a lot, but I just feel like, you know, uh, I don't know what other pieces have missed, but just feel like we need to have this notion of, uh, you know, rate or like a risk card for data. Yeah. And yeah. people need to be more informed about those things. Yeah. I mean, uh, thank you so much, Rajana. I'm really glad we got you back because I think you've done two or three fantastic things, uh, which I couldn't personally myself, um, not being a technologist and a panelist. So I think the first uh, thing that I will flag for those of us who might have missed it is actually we see a level of disagreement in the panel in terms of whether anonymization is relevant or not. Uh, and if I look at that as a spectrum, I am hearing voices that say actually it's not relevant at all because it never touches our systems. But then I think there are people who are seriously saying, even if it doesn't touch your system, even if the you know tree falls in the forest and no one sees it, it's still fallen in the forest, you know, um, to use an inappropriate maybe metaphor, but um, analogy. But so I guess the, the question is really, you know, where on the spectrum of anonymization or pseudonymization basic techniques are people really following when they're setting up their systems itself, even if they are not you know, even if they're providing a service to a third party and them themselves not downloading or looking at that data, is there some kind of basic guardrails? I'm going to park that question there because I think that falls very much within the realm of a personal data protection bill type of question. So maybe Hasgeek will have us back to kind of fight about that later. But I actually wanted to pick up on something that uh, Srijana just ended on, which is kind of, um, even if it's aggregates, even if it's kind of you know, metadata, uh, it, it has this kind of privacy denuding uh, implication. And uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, there's this famous uh, Princeton review case in the US that everyone talked about like four years ago, where uh, they were targeting areas where Asians lived uh, to sell Princeton review material. And it did not profile a single person, but they were like, ah, this is an Asian ghetto. We'll just price it like $20 higher and because we know that Asians care this much about getting into Princeton or whatever. Um, and that's a classic, you know, community level harm. Uh, I guess what that opens up for this discussion, and I'd love to open it up to all the panelists, is um, when you are, so one thing that the report does say is that it's going to ask companies to share metadata, right? So leave anonymization aside or not, but where there is metadata, it's going to allow one, set up something like a metadata directory 
uh, uh, I'm curious to understand what you think about that. And then the second one is allow certain companies to access other companies' metadata. Um, I think we've touched on the privacy risks. I'm just very curious one to hear, and this is the first question I'll ask all of you. Do you, what do you think are the risks that come from sharing metadata? Are there any risks? And would you do that given the current metadata, metadata you're sitting on? And again, I uh, maybe I'll, I'll kind of start with Srijana because she's not been with us for the first half now and then really open it up to anyone else who wants to kind of jump in. Hey, thanks, Malvika. I'll keep this short. And, you know, I would just say at the outset, right, that any information is power, it's of value, right? And the line between metadata and data is very fuzzy. So what you even as a technologist, as an engineer, you know, things that are, can be coded into the uh, fields or could be coded in key value pairs, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, choices we have to make when we are even coming up with a data model. And so metadata is also information. Sharing metadata will reveal a lot of uh, proprietary assets of an organization, not the actual data itself, but it can reveal a lot about um, the organization's process, tools, and it can also be used to streamline de-anonymization attacks, right? So for instance, if you know that this particular hospital is capturing certain biometrics, symptoms, treatment, whatever, right? There's a lot you could do with it. So uh, like that. Would yeah. Also, that. also, it does seem to me to add to add to Shrinath's point that metadata is metadata is probably IP though, right? Like, I would consider all our metadata to be IP. So, uh, I'm I'm not uh, uh, I'm not sure I can imagine what metadata would not be IP. Like, maybe the use case is far too narrow. Well, actually, that's an open question. Just to quickly answer the legal question, so one place I can add value. That's uh, it's on the fence, you know. Not all metadata is considered IP, but yeah. Back to uh, anyone else who wants to share. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with the same thing. I would say that, uh, uh, like, first of all, who would decide what metadata is IP and what metadata is not IP? Would a lawyer come and sit in our office and uh, look at our metadata and then make a call that, hey, this metadata is not IP, man. You just need to open it up. How do you do that? I mean, uh, and what metadata I'm sharing? I can just say that I'm not, this is my metadata. I'm just storing these three columns. I mean, how is it? Going yeah, we'll be in quotes all day long, basically, right? Like I will, I will lawyer up and battle for every single piece of my metadata being IP, right? Like I, I, I mean, Absolutely. I, every, every company would lawyer up, right? And then I agree with you. Yeah. There's no, like there's no end or there's no benefit of this, right? Then in that case. For sure. I mean, if I look, if we look at any of our processes also, a, just the things that we capture to make our service better, that's metadata in my view. And why would I open that up? Uh, and how is it going to help uh, the ultimate goal of uh, doing good for society? If uh, even if that can be proved, uh, what's the next step? I'm I, I'm completely flabbergasted here. Completely. I I plus one the flabbergastedness. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, metadata can reveal a lot of sensitive things. And I think what is slightly more troubling, even more troubling, is that this is meant to be a machine readable. I think that's what the paper says. It's meant to be a machine readable directory that all businesses publish. Now, it would be so easy for a malicious actor to just write a bot that goes and crawls all of these metadata directories, so-called directories, and collate valuable business information. They'll know that, oh, this company stores biometric info this company so something else something else it's it just opens up it it brings a huge attack vector to every single company that is plugged into the npd framework and in addition to whatever risk that we just talked about yeah and not to mention the attack vector from the marketing people i mean once your metadata is open with the data that that you have the marketing and the sales guys will start bombarding you emails i have this data man just buy it from us kind of thing for an example, yeah. right, built with us, uh, stores information, I mean, uh, tracks information about what your website is built on. And, and then they sell that information to people saying that, hey, this particular business is using XYZ software. And then use that uh, mailing list to sort of bombard people uh, uh, to say that buy this software kind of thing. So this is one way in which metadata can be used. Um, so first of all, maintaining a metadata is not an easy task, right? There are companies which are coming up with tooling for metadata itself. 
And especially if your data is growing at a very large pace and evolving, maintenance itself is a headache. Now, so yeah, and if that changes and your metadata, now you come into the world of versioning of metadata, right? And whatever you are making it machine readable, it changes every day. How does anybody make a value out of it? So for just talking from a practical aspect, right? It's a time sink, it's a security risk, right? And it's non-maintainable. While there can be parts of the data which can be useful for the larger economy and larger social good, just providing metadata of all the data you have is just not maintainable. Yeah, well, um, I mean, it's fascinating to hear you guys talk about this because uh, that was exactly my understanding. So, I mean, we don't think uh, all metadata is IP, but then it is kind of the company's intelligence currently. It's not something that's people talk about in the US, you know, how it would develop is through litigation, like one company says to another. But I think that's why this framework is so significant. Itihasa is uh, the people who are writing this report. They are based in Bangalore, for those of you who are, because this report is trying to do the work of that lawyer, right? It, it's got a section, section seven, I think. Uh, can you hear me okay? Sorry, my internet connection. Uh, thank you. Um, but essentially what this report is trying to do is to say one, um, businesses will must set up a metadata directory, which will be administered by the NPD authority. And then it says when a company you know, figures out I want this data set, they can make a request to that other company to reveal that the metadata of their underlying data. Uh, personally, there's a section where they say metadata and underlying data. It's a little bit unclear. So that like opens up all sorts of issues. Uh, but I guess the, the reasoning behind this is that it will assist competition and innovation so that an Indian company that may not have access to a vast trove of metadata or other kinds of non-personal data can now innovate and so on. Um, I think this just brings us very swiftly onto like the final thing that I want to discuss and we have kind of 10 minutes. I think the background premise, you know, we, for all this is this idea of digital industrialization. I don't know if one of, I think a committee member is joining the next panel as well. And somebody I was with at the beginning of the week uh, said, you know, this is all about digital industrialization because Indian companies have suffered from not having access to particular types of non-personal data. And so this is India's pitch to kind of open up the, that data set uh, for small Indian companies who may not have that. Keeping aside all the data security and data privacy risks, I can't believe I'm saying this, but keeping aside the data privacy and data security risks, if there was a perfectly safe, private, secure way to share this NPD, um, I would love to you know, hear your thoughts. Do you think there's some reason you would want access to something like this as if you didn't? Uh, yeah, just curious for your thoughts. Again, open to all the panelists. Uh, I think, sorry, can I, can I jump in? I, I don't know what that phrase really means because if you look around you, uh, the last decade in India has been, we witnessed a huge digital revolution, haven't we? So hasn't it already happened? And also is it not happening at a massive scale every single day? So I, I don't know what more can happen. Uh, which will, you know, outright change whatever is happening right now. And the, and the other thing was, there's no, there's no, it seems like a lot of hand waving. There, there is, there seems to be no way to quantify what exactly would be the benefits when you can't even define the core, uh, core terms used, for example, community, community data, public good, what exactly is public good? Uh, I mean, for, so it seems, it, it seems very vague. And really, if that was the if, if the intention is to encourage here, it's not encourage; it's force and mandate. But if the if the if it's to encourage innovation, wouldn't it be better? I'm just postulating. I, I I'm not really qualified to uh, have an opinion here, so I'm just postulating. Wouldn't it be better to incentivize companies and whoever uh, builds up data sets to release them. There's this whole open data connected to the free and open source FOSS software movement that has been around for decades, right? So, and open data, some of the most valuable data sets in the world are open data, be it your, you know, open street map mapping data or Wikipedia, the knowledge graph. It's all open data and nobody had to mandate for these things to come out. So 
if we want this at an industrial scale in India, can't there be a better way to incentivize companies? How exactly? I, I don't really know. And I encourage them to willingly come contribute data than uh, in very questionable ways force them to comply. And when, when you force companies to comply, it will always be, you know, people will do the minimum minimum stuff required to comply. I, I don't know if such forced compliance will produce valuable enough data that will really create a, an, an innovation revolution. I, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, to, to, to add to that, something that I feel very passionately about uh, with this, this idea of building businesses in India uh, and, and streamlining that, right? I feel like there, I feel like if that is the problem statement, there are many ways to solve that problem statement, right? Like, for example, if we're saying that, oh, today no small company has the amount of data um, that uh, other companies have, like, you know, maybe Facebook or Google or whatever, because that data is no longer in India. I feel like that's a slightly different problem, right? I feel like that's the problem of, like, the reason why India has historically not allowed the automobile sector to, um, and why we have such a heavy import duty on cars that are made outside because we wanted to stimulate our own automobile industry. And so we said, you have to manufacture cars in India. So that was one way to solve the problem. The problem was not necessarily to tell all companies that, hey, by the way, every single thing that you know about making cars is now public. Um, that, there, are, there, are many, there are many ways to solve the problem of ease of business and creating a level playing field, um, but hitting it at the roots of 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 uh, of how businesses operate uh, and changing that is uh, I, I think it's a it's 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 a, it's a huge uh, legal precedent. It's almost like philosophically, I would say it's like you're you're it's like uh, uh, some kind of capitalism versus communism argument almost that this will descend into, where where maybe this model of evolution in uh, the innovation we don't believe in, and so we should just get rid of capitalism and have a better way of doing things. Um, that, that's what it seems to descend uh, into for me if I if I if I think about it. So 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 this alleged benefit mix uh, does not hold any water with for me given given the amount of regulatory hurdles there are for a small company to already do business in India. Just to take a small example, if you are a company based in India and you want to take recurring payments from people outside India, um, that is that is hurting small businesses more today than. Uh, the, the ease of doing that and the hurdles in doing that, that is hurting the small business more today than, than uh, creating a data-based level playing field, right? So, so the, it, it, it does not compute for me. Yeah, I agree with uh, both Kailash and Tanmay. I think, uh, I think uh, we, we, these, these two will be very good beer buddies with me, man. I mean, we just should sit down together. And <laughs> dance, or, I, mean, we, we think alike. <laughs> I think it's very similar, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I, I, in a way, I, first of all, that uh, term you used, I had to Google it. I didn't even know what you meant. And I, I, even after Googling, I couldn't figure out what it meant. So I'm still stuck on that. But yeah, I mean, uh, see, we, for example, right? I mean, data is not a big problem. Uh, from the perspective, I mean, we can always, if you really want to get data, you can get the data. Even for if you are a small company or a big company. And first of all, I am not even convinced that big data actually solves the problem of whatever of AI or whatever your Google level data also has not solved a lot of problems yet. We still don't have proof that actually more data will just solve this problem. It seems more like you have put terms like economic good, uh, all these kind of terms like a marketing material and then okay we all sign up for it uh, they could as well just say what the actual which are the companies that they actually want the data from and then work with those companies rather than say put it as a regulation and then all of us have to just uh, listen to that i would say there is some other underlying thing they want some data why don't they just come out and say hey i, I want this data this is the data i'm looking for and then we all agree to it and figure out what to do with it. Yeah, I completely. And, and I think if, if Google and and if you don't want the Googles and the Facebooks of the world to have data, then just stop them from operating in India. Do what China did, right? China was very clear. They said that we are not going to let our the the social fabric of our country's IT be built outside China. And so now they have a tremendous amount of innovation happening in China around WeChat and 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 and, and, and their search services and their social and, and they do that. I mean. That is a way of also solving the problem. A, this a, without hitting at the roots of every single thing that you understand about uh, about how companies work, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll give just yeah. one example. Uh, so we are actually doing one uh, uh, project with uh, IIIT Hyderabad to collect uh, uh, speech data. So uh, we are, uh, uh, I mean, obviously the government of India itself has sanctioned MIT and all have uh, done this. They want to collect a good amount of uh, speech data for what, uh, as a data set corpus so that uh, uh, Indian companies can build or companies can build. So the idea here is that it will be open source all the data that will be collected, very similar to Mozilla Common Voice or whatever, and then you put it out there. Now, when I put it out there, right, I know for sure that the companies which are going to benefit out of it is going to be Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, because they have the GPUs and they have the compute power to actually make sense of the data. The actual startups in India will find it very hard to use that same data uh, to actually build something out of that. So it's, it's, it's sort of confusing what works or what doesn't work. And this whole point of uh, idealism of uh, let everybody have access to data. What will we do with the data? I mean, that's something that needs to be defined. So uh, I have, I mean, I like, actually like really enjoyed these points all the way from Kaila, Chaitanya, <laughs> everyone. But I also have a slightly differing point of view. Uh, one is that, you know, I, I've lately been uh, working on some of these health projects with the government and uh, in general, right, like even these multilingual data sets, data on health conditions and so on, right, there is a huge value to be derived from there if it was available, right, and like uh, Chaitanya called out, of course, the Googles of the world and the, uh, you know, Googles and the Microsoft of the world will like extract more juice, but it also gives an opportunity for the smaller players, for the academicians, like say in the COVID setting, right, uh, there were like, data was not there out there. I mean, of course, I, I, it's, it's not like private parties like uh, making the silos of data, it is the government itself and, you know, different government organizations that did not put it all together. But not having access to data prevented a lot of uh, things that we could have gotten right. And in fact, it was involved in, and the plumbing is so bad with a lot of these government agencies that it's, it's a critical problem to solve. There are indeed data sets that can contribute to societal well-being. And because of how our incentive system works, right, um, you know, the public good data sets are not really, I mean, uh, you know, no, not prioritized in a lot of the organizations. That, but having said all that, I agree with what uh, Kailash said that you know the right way to set this up should be a, a proper set of incentives, right? And it again goes back to this uh, whole question of what are we really trying to do here, right? So the whole point of this PDP and the NPD framework is to extract value from the data for society uh, while safeguarding privacy, uh, people against privacy violations and, you know, proprietary rights of the companies, right? So that is really the underlying thing. Now, given that we should follow this maxim of, uh, like, you know, first we should do no harm. And where we are, right, I'm indeed honestly worried that without standardization of the technical definitions itself, without standardization of the technical process itself also, right? It's not just say anonymization. The ideal thing would be to say that, you know, this is the tool you need to do and this is the very specific level of anonymization or not exactly anonymization is I think very crude term. This is uh, the specific uh, level of privacy safety that you need to uh, get to. And in the absence of all of that, right, we are definitely going to have lots of arbitrary data transfers, which are not necessarily going to be in the interest of the society. This will be a case of some kind of crony capitalism, right? And, you know, I, I just feel like the right way to really ground all of these regulations would be in terms of the actual risks and benefits. See, just the identification is not harmful, but if you identify me with a health condition, there is a risk. If you identify me with a particular, like, you know, financial condition, then there is a le different level of risk. So I think quantifying that risk and also, you know, just thinking of this whole data as a, like an information good, right? So this is an information good, which has multiple producers, all the folks who are the subjects, the folks who are contributing to the collection, the folks uh, who are like, you know, coming up with algorithms that derive extra juice. So ideally we should think of this as like an information good in a, like a royalties type of framework, where as data value is derived from data, all the producers are compensated equally. And whenever there's a risk, 
you know there should be a redressal mechanism so in the absence of all of this i think our framework is premature yeah and also to just i think we can make a lot of these problems more tractable by looking at specific data sets so if you want to solve a health crisis problem then then there should be a foundation or a campaign to get that particular data set for which it will be much more easy to define and standardize these terms uh and to define that for this particular data set this is what is bia and what not right as opposed to a generic definition across all data sets that exist on the planet it is much easier to scope it into a particular type of data for a particular use case and then create a foundation around it that is comp- composed of multiple stakeholders producers consumers researchers etc that is a much easier and more tractable way of kind of uh really solving this problem if it wants to be if, if if you want to solve it yeah and so i'm going to just kind of pull us all kind of pull the threads together because i see that we are on time and uh, nadika is being very good and not uh, cutting us off the live stream uh, but i mean i think i heard a lot of things there and i should clarify right like i think what is interesting about this framework especially from the legal perspective is it departs from Uh, i can say per, now i'm now i'm independent for the next few months so i can i don't have any organizational constraints i think it's uh, in many ways it breaks with all of the theory around data regulation that we've had since the 70s since large scale computer systems were first developed so not quite sure where this mental model is coming from i don't think anybody would disagree with objectives like you know in a time of a crisis how do we marshal data you know obviously fukushima happened and then all of the um, i think it was the electric companies that had a location data close by and uh, they could pick up radiation data and you know that's a strange one that came to mind when uh, shrujan was speaking earlier so you can have specific instances where there's a very clearly in articulated objective i think the problem here it was great to get from this panel that the objective is really not clear for the multitude of us who are kind of engaging with data from the regulatory side or clearly from the implementational side as well um and then i guess if you're not clear with your objectives then the whole you know the everything else just gets more and more complicated uh kind of bring it all together what i'm hearing is uh a if anyone on this panel decides to ever have a beer i would love to be invited to because i i had some hoots on 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 mute uh, i definitely think the best things i heard was a uh, database level playing field and this whole idea of digital communism is what i'm going to call it uh, which i think is is kind of brought to mind for those of you who want to do a bit of reading graham greenleaf is his excellent professor i love to quote everywhere he wrote this fantastic article um, about the pdp bill and he hasn't commented on the npd bill he's such an australian he said he calls it gdpr light with chinese characteristics which i thought was an excellent <laughs> summary <laughs> yes a published uh, article that he wrote about the pdp bill so I, i i do think the world is also watching india in a strange way and just wondering what it what we're up to uh, and i'd love to invite technologists like you tomorrow is the day after is the deadline to the committee's response so even if you could just write an email to the committee i think it would be amazing for them to have you know some of your thoughts uh, down on paper 